welcome to Fairfax Community Church. Good morning and welcome to Fairfax Community Church on this celebrating the 12th day of Christmas on the following Sunday after the 12th day, this being Epiphany. So we want to welcome everyone who is uh, joining us on Zoom and those who may be even watching the video later, welcome. And we welcome everyone who is with us in person this morning. So good to be able to be together and we want to thank you. Um, also uh, bless both um, Joanne Saltzgaber and Tom Finch who are with us uh, to share their beautiful music this morning. So let us just take a moment and take a deep breath. And just center ourselves in spirit. Loving creator, we are grateful for your presence here that we can feel deep within our hearts. We dedicate this service to you today that we may grow closer to you in body, word, spirit. And may you bless us with your presence. We pray this in your many names. Amen. So I invite us to uh, say together the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin, written by Ruth Burgess. Lightener of the world. Okay, let's try that again. Star maker God, lightener of the world. Bless us and warm us into peace and loving. Guide us to the light of the Christ child all the length of our days. And then may we, like the Magi, having been so touched, carry the light of your love back at home by a different road. And so, I invite us to sing together our centering song, which many of you uh, know, Spirit of the Living God. Simple movements, you know with it, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me, melt me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. And then the second time we sing it, we say us. So, really invoking, we can sing it as a prayer, invoking uh, Spirit, Holy Spirit on us, and both individually and collectively. Let us sing that. Spirit of the
hand over your heart and hand over your belly. And imagine a grounding cord going down from your tailbone, down through your feet, right down into Mother Earth. And feel yourself like a great tree stretching far and deep and wide, anchoring yourself in this great Mother Earth that we have and nurtures us. And feel yourself held, nurtured, grounded. And then draw up some of that life force energy back up through those roots, back up through the soles of your feet, up through your legs, and let it bathe your root chakra as you also feel held. And then gently bring it up into your second and third chakra, your solar plexus. bathe you with peace. And then bring it up to your heart chakra. <coughs> and imagine the color green. And then bring it up to your throat and gently to your third eye and your crown chakra. And let it spill out like fun around you. And then imagine a golden cord going from the top of your head up into the cosmos, into the heavens. Connect to your own guiding star, your guiding light. That is both your divine self, your higher self, collective divine self that we know as God of Spirit. And feel that larger force guide you. Know that it is with you. And then bring some of that back down through that old cord down into the top of your head. And let it bathe your body in golden light. And then let it come to center again in your heart. And know that you are guided and held by both Mother Earth and the cosmos and your own guiding star. And from this place, I invite us to reflect on the prayers that we want to share with the community today. And as it is our practice, I invite us to say our prayer, whatever way we would like to address God, Goddess, Eternal Spirit, whatever language we want to use, and then share our prayer, and then conclude by saying, God, in your grace, do you hear? If you would like to say a prayer <clears throat> via Zoom, go ahead and unmute yourself, say a prayer, and unmute yourself.
joy. Help us this day to be in your arms, to let ourselves feel that wonder and awe. And help a friend of mine, John, who just has been diagnosed with a stomach cancer, and he just met with the surgeon. They're moving fairly quickly to help them. And may everyone who's ill or suffering feel helped in your arms. And lastly, a prayer for my sister in law, Carolyn, who uh, appears to be in her, her final month or so. Uh, she's starting to really separate from this world. And prayers for her uh, and her husband and family, all the caregivers, uh, to help them just have it as peaceful as can be. And God, all of this is done in your grace. You hear so uncertain now. I just pray that we will be well and well and well so that we can get there. That we'll be well while we're there and we'll be able to come home without any problems from COVID. Um, and I pray for everyone who is being affected by it. It's just raging through this country and even in our church right now. And um, uh, I don't know. I just um, hope we can get through it and find better ways to deal with the angst and and, and the whole the whole mess. Um, yeah. God in your grace. You can hear our prayers. Is anyone on Zoom who would like to share a prayer?
Dear Lord, I just want to express my gratitude for the bright silence of your presence that helps us to transcend our mind. I've been praying for my situation to change, but I'm feeling you're whispering inside me. Something more is in store. My relationship with you, Lord, as the all and all through everything, and who I thought I was, maybe really kind of a mistaken condition based on my situation. So thank you, and help me to stay open to the deepening of our relationship. Thank you. God in grace, you hear our prayers. Great spirit, beloved, ever present, God, <clears throat> I ask for prayers for Judith, our contemplative arts musician who has found out she can't bear weight on her knee, on her leg for at least through February. Uh, may her healing be complete and as soon as possible. May she get all the help that she needs. Also prayers for my two beautiful boys, Gabe and Theo, and Theo's girlfriend, Cleo. And may they stay healthy and happy. And a quick little prayer for my camera on my computer to be healed. <laughs> and then Gabe can help, help me fix it. God in your grace. Divine and loving presence, I I'm so grateful that you were with me yesterday in the unending Catch-22 experiences of transferring from my phone from AT&T to Verizon and just being able to move through it without screaming at anybody and losing it and finally discovering a solution. Help me to remember the advice that I give other people that if I'm thinking this shouldn't be happening, I'm in denial and I need to revise my expectations in order to reduce my suffering and any suffering of, of anyone else. And I thank you for the privilege that I will have the, over the next four weeks to learn more about how to ground myself when things external to me are going crazy and how to, to develop my ability to stay calm and to be realistic and honest with myself about where I'm expecting something that's not realistic. And may all of us who are dealing with ongoing, unknowing, and the stress of that, that we may all deepen our experience of you, of your presence, surrounding us, holding us, and living deeply within us, in our hearts. In your many names, God, in your grace, you hear our prayers.
we trust, loving God, that you hear our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, those that are in the quietness of our own hearts. We indeed continue to pray for healing, for our country, for our homes, for our families. God, in your grace, you hear our prayers. So let us say together this translation of the prayer of Yeshua, written by John Philip. <coughs> Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, may we know your presence here, seeking your will upon earth. Grant all your creatures food for today and strength for all beings. Pardon our falseness as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our need, but lead us to new birth. For the glory of life and the light of life are yours forever. Amen. Amen. So as we prepare to receive the sacred text, as we know, it's our tradition to sing the Shema, which means to awaken. So we awaken our spirits to receive the sacred texts. Um, does somebody want to sing the Shema? You want to sing the Shema? Okay. And then the Matthew passage is in two parts. The story of the Magi and the story of uh, Mary and Joseph. Um, does someone want to read the, the first part of the Matthew passage? Anybody on Zoom? Okay, Ruth, thank you. Um, does anybody want to read the Second part, Jim, you want to read the second part of the yeah, sure, sure. Great. Dean, you want to read the poem? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Let us receive uh, these sacred texts today. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, <clears throat> go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, Bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, 
went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. something completely different. I smile at the rain, even though it's not exactly what I had in mind. I smile at the rain, even though I was hoping it could wait just a few more days. I smile at the rain, even though my long-awaited retreat will be quite different without its company. I may not see the sunrise or the moon set over the mountains or the morning sun moving tenderly over the bodies of trees. I may not hear the dawn chorus or the cry of a hawk. I may not get to walk or sit outside without bundling up or getting wet, sometimes both. Instead, I will behold the mosses in rain-drenched rapture. Hear the gentle music of raindrops and the sweet song of the creek. And I will feel the boundless joy and gratitude of countless beings who have been thirsty for so long, gently reminding me that this rain is a precious gift, welcomed and needed by many, including me. I smile at the rain and I am it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for that. For that beautiful reading. And give thanks for all the sacred readings. And if for any reason you're not quite sure how that poem fits in with the epiphany, just wait. <laughs> and hopefully uh, it will become clear as we go on. And Gabe, if you can hear me, I'm going to invite you to the spotlight uh, sanctuary again, please. That would be wonderful. So here we are after uh, 12 days of Eastertide, as you know, that is an actual liturgical season of the church. Christmas is not over on December 26th. That's just the second day of Christmas. Christmas tide lasts for 12 days and it concludes on January 6th, which is the celebration of Epiphany. And this being the closest Sunday after, we are celebrating Epiphany today. 
And if you are just tuning in or new to the season of Epiphany, it's good for us to just review and remember a few of the essential components of this text. And it's really one of my favorite stories. I love this story. I get so excited every year when it comes around again and we get to look at it. And as we know, at the core of the story are the three magi, sometimes known as three wise men. I'm not sure why English translations pretty much always translate it as wise men, but if you look carefully in your Bible, you'll see a footnote at the bottom, it'll say magi, because that's the actual word. Later, uh, there was a tradition that they were three kings, so whenever you see the nativity of the three kings, this is who we're talking about, the three magi. And the word magi is plural for the word magus, which is where we get the word magic or magician. In this case, it was actually a title because we know they were from the east, and so we know they were actually Zoroastrian priests or Zoroastrian shamans. As you may know, Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest world religions from the area in ancient times known as Persia, kind of modern-day Iran. So as magi, they would have been practitioners of esoteric knowledge. Esoteric, sometimes people think that's a spooky word, but it actually just means hidden or deep within. So it's the inner spiritual knowledge. And as such, they would have been practitioners of astronomy and astrology and even alchemy. As Zoroastrians, they would have believed in God. It was a religion. And so they actually guided their lives and sought discernment for where God wanted them to go based on signs they saw in the natural world. So they were paying attention to the movement of the stars, to the movement of the planets, to their intuition, to their dreams, where God told them this really, really important birth was going to happen. For the whole world, there was going to be this new light coming onto the planet that was really, really important. It was so important that it led them to go out across the desert, leave the comforts of home, just so they could be part of this experience and pay him homage and offer their gifts. And they did that. And I believe opening their treasure chests also means they opened their hearts. And I believe they had this encounter with Source, with divine love, at that same nativity scene that we talked about on Christmas Eve. They were so blessed by this light that they went home by a different road. I believe that's also symbolic that something changed in their lives and they went home by a different route. Now again, they got there by following a star. And that is the other important symbol in this story. It said the star went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child lay. And we know that there was probably a whole conglomerate of planets that was a bright light in the sky at that time. But to me, this can also be a metaphor for our lives as the story always falls at the beginning of the new year. We can think about what is the light that's calling us forth, that's urging us to kind of maybe leave our comfort zones a little bit. And it might be our own personal New Year's intention or New Year's resolution. And in the light of this text, I invite us to reflect on not just our own personal resolutions, but where is God calling us in the new year? This light for the Magi was connected with God's call for them. So it's an important time to reflect. Where is God calling each of us in our own lives? And where is God calling us together as a community? Where is God calling us as a collective as we set out into the new year? How do we pay attention to dreams and to intuition that help us do that? Well, another key component of the story for the Magi that helped get them there was that they had to circumvent Herod in order to do it. Now, we know Herod was a historical figure. He was king of Judea, um, king of the sort of Jewish realm at that time. We know that he was probably a very corrupt king. And we know that he uh, falsely um, wanted to acquire from the Magi where the child was born. But that later he really wanted to destroy him. So the text tells us that he is ruled by fear. Now, in our own lives, we could have both kind of external and internal Herods that may try and wreak havoc 
with our desires or our dreams. Right? In our external world, we know that there are corrupt political leaders out there, and there are also systems of oppression and injustice that we work together to try and dismantle and heal to bring God life in the world. Internally, I also believe that sometimes there can be Herods in our own heads. The Herods in our heads, I like to call them. And if we have a dream or a goal, it might even be our own personal year's resolution, we might set out with excitement, and then there might be voices that come in. They might be self-doubt, like, oh, I can't do that, or I'm not good enough, or it might be criticism, oh, that's really stupid, or it might be fear. And so sometimes we have to kind of do a dance with the Herods in our heads in order to actually get to the goal or get to the source. And there's an interesting reading I've been doing lately that to me also comments on this. And in our the Interfaith Counseling Center that Ruth is also part of, we've been studying books by John Prendergast. He's actually local, he's from Petaluma, he's a therapist, and he's really in touch with somatic awareness or body awareness and how it can lead us to deeper peace. And so he talks about how he believes in working with so many clients over the years that we all often have a particular, what he calls a core limiting belief. Core limiting belief about ourselves that sometimes is kind of unconscious but kind of bubbles up. And at the core of that, often, it's, oh, I'm not good enough or there's something wrong with me. or And it can kind of inhibit us. It might be a kind of part of our monkey mind, right? But he says if we really drop into a place of centeredness and pay attention to our body and the sensations we're having in our bodies and then really center ourselves, we can ask the question, but what's the deeper truth? What's the deeper note that I need And if we can drop into that, we often find that we are indeed loved unconditionally, accepted as we are, which leads us back to that state of peace, which then leads us to the present moment which helps us eventually bring that light of God's call, whatever it is, into being from a balanced place. So sometimes we have to dance with the Herod in our heads so that we can come back to source, to God, to the divine light, so that then we are able to perhaps live out what God is calling us to do, or even just our own goals, desires, and intentions. So we, like the Magi, set out, we're following the star, we're following God's call for our lives. We dance with the hairs in our heads in order to get there. And then there's one other key component, I think, that's important for living out and following the line of the star. And that is to remember that we can set all the goals and plans that we want, but sometimes God's timing is not our own. God's timing is not our own timing. And we in the Western world, we like charts and lists. I like charts and lists. I make lists all the time. I really like to check things off my boxes. As a matter of fact, sometimes if I've already done something, I'll write it down just so that I can check it off. <laughs> and I don't know, it makes me feel like I'm moving forward or I've accomplished something. You know, in the Western world, we kind of like that, right? Um, but you know, if the pandemic in the last two years has taught us anything, it's that we're not necessarily in control of everything, are we? Sometimes we have to surrender. The blessed slave plans or the blessed slave timetables, we just have to surrender and say, you know what? I don't know. I don't know what the timing is going to be, how long it's going to take. And to me, that is where this second story, as the story continues, can really, really help us where we are right now as people, as humans on this planet, as a nation. And that is the rest of the story, that we kind of often just leave Mary and Joseph and, hey, Magi come, great. And then we just sort of move on, right? We end up in Lent, and we kind of forget about what happens in between. Well, the next part of the story is also really important. So we remember that to even get to the place where the major scene is, right? Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem because there was a census, right? Mary happened to give birth while they're there. I looked it up, and it's a 30-hour walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And if you're on a donkey and you're pregnant, you know, it's going to take you five or six days at least to get there, right? So they're away from home. 
And all these amazing things happen, right? There's angels and there's shepherds and now there's magi. Wow, that's amazing. And now I'm sure Mary at least is probably ready to go home. Don't you think? She just gave birth to her first child in the stable. They're hanging out in a stable. Maybe they got comfy there. But now they're probably like, okay, yay, let's take all this stuff and go home. I'm thinking if I'm, you know, a new mother with an infant child, I'm thinking she probably wants the comforts of home. She probably wants her extended family, right? But instead, God says, nope, sorry. Instead of going back north home, you're going to need to go to southwest, completely opposite direction of home, and go to Egypt to hang out there for a while. If I was Mary, I'd be kind of disappointed. I don't know. I'd be thinking, really? God, I am having to get back on a donkey, but I don't get to go home. And so I'm guessing they may have been a little disappointed. This was not probably part of their plan. But according to the text, it was part of God's plan, which is kind of interesting. Because the text tells us this was to fill the prophecy spoken by God out of Egypt, I have called my son. So first, we notice, probably disappointing for them, they had to circumvent their plans, do something not expected. They had to travel all the way to Egypt. And then they had to hang out there, and they didn't know how long it was going to be. They had no idea. The text tells us that they stayed there until the death of Herod. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful that Herod just sort of, you know, keeled over right away after the story happened. They probably had to hang out there for a few years. Keep waiting. Now, God, nope, not ready yet. Okay. Now, God, nope, not ready yet. <laughs> Until finally they got another dream, and it was clear, and God said, now it's safe to go back. It wasn't safe for them to go back. They had to hang out all the same. Does that feel familiar at all? Anything? I think we can relate to this story after spending two years in a pandemic. We don't know how long it's going to be. How long, oh Lord, how long? Now? Nope. Now? Nope. So we've had to learn to trust in the present moment, trust in the mystery, trust that God is with us. And rather than making long-term plans, I think it's actually teaching us a spiritual skill, which is what's right in front of us in this moment. God is with us here in this moment. We can make certain plans. But we have to be adaptable and trust that even in this place, God is still with us. And I think that was true for Mary and Joseph in Egypt, too. Some people believe that Mary and Joseph were part of the Essene spiritual community, and they were outposts in certain areas. There was one in Alexander. It's possible that they traveled in Egypt and hung out in Alexander for Alexandria for a while. And there they may have learned other things they didn't expect to learn. They have been, may have been part of the Egyptian mystery school and learned some other cool spiritual stuff they weren't expecting while they were hanging out in Egypt. To me, this is what the poem also tells us, which is why I partnered the poem with this passage. The author of the poem is excited. She's getting ready to go on a camping trip out into the forest. And she has these expectations of the things she wants to see and the things she wants to do. And then it rains. And so the things that she was expecting to do are not the things that she was able to do. But instead, she says, instead I would behold the mosses in the rain-drenched rapture, hear the gentle music of raindrops and the sweet song of the creek. These were things that were unexpected that came because of the rain. Even though the rain was not part of her plan or her ideal goal. I think that there may be a variety of things that we've been learning while we're hanging out in Egypt. And I think about how we've reflected even as a community through this pandemic. I had thought last fall that maybe some of our other renters would be back and we could come back up to um, kind of where we had been before and then that didn't happen. And I remember instead that when we started um, almost two years ago, and this whole thing started, and we thought, oh, we'll just do from the sanctuary. Do you remember that, Lynn? It was a complete disaster. We didn't have the internet tech set up 
for us to even have a strong enough signal to zoom from the sanctuary. And Lynn and I grabbed up all my stuff on my laptop and we raced to the office. The whole thing was a big disaster. We, thank God everybody was patient, but it's not exactly what we hoped for a worship service. In the meantime, while we're hanging out in Egypt, we've completely revamped the internet in the sanctuary so that we have a stronger signal now. This fall, the thought of doing a hybrid service was like flying to the moon without a rocket. It was like, how the heck is this going to happen? But thanks to Jim's gentle patience and us working together, we kept working at it. Trial and error, because it didn't all go smoothly at first, until by Christmas Eve, we were able to have a successful hybrid service when we had guests, when it was particularly important. Praise be to Jesus, that is like a miracle to me. Miracle with a lot of heart. We've been learning things while we're hanging out in Egypt. And all the things that we're learning are things that will, I believe, help support the larger call, the larger vision that I believe God has for us, which is to eventually be a spiritual center, a spiritual sangha that will receive guests and speakers and have amazing spiritual retreats and be a light, a beacon for the world. I still believe that's the big star that God is calling us to. God has not forgotten that dream. It's still being affirmed. It's just we are actually learning and doing a lot of things behind the scenes that are all important that are going to help with that when the time is right. So we can remember God is with us in this time, just like God was with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus when they had to hang out in Egypt. And then when the time was right, God told them the dream, and they went back home. But maybe they went back home by a different road because their hearts were also changed. We're invited to trust in the moment, to notice the green mosses and, and all the things that are here in this present moment, and remember that God is still with us. Trusting moment to moment, reflecting on the inner spiritual life that we're learning, and trusting that God's call is still with us. So I invite us to just take a deep breath and reflect for a moment. And to reflect even on the images in this home story. The images of the Magi paying attention to God's voice for their lives. Through the stars, intuition, dreams, the natural world until it led them to this place where the child lay and we had this encounter source. The image of following a star, God's call for our lives that calls us forth both individually and collectively as community. The image of dancing with the herons in our heads to befriend them in such a way that we can have deeper peace and not obstruct the path. And then the invitation to trust in the liminal space that God is still with us and teaching us skills that we need for the journey. Let us reflect for a moment how that might be true for our own lives. And true for us as a community. And give thanks to God for being with us all. Amen.
much a part of what I'm dealing with right now, and uh, so I really thank you for that. Just yesterday, I heard Ocean Robbins speaking, if you know who he is, just a delightful person, but um, he said he changed his life when he um, was able to uh, fully, ex how did he put it, radically accept reality, meaning that whatever is, is what he had to deal with, and that he had the belief that it was for his own good. So um, I've been working on that. It's not an easy journey. <laughs> but um, <coughs> I'm getting lots of messages that that's what it's all about. You know? it's, um, just trusting that what happens is um, the universe working for my good. God working for my good. Thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. This was a beautiful service and um, just a lovely creative way to be thinking about the pandemic experience. And uh, I feel very, very blessed to be part of this community uh, when we can do so much. I can remember somebody saying to me, and it was the man that's sitting over there, but I can never remember how to pronounce your name. Is it Jean? Yeah. <laughs> Jean, yes. <laughs> Him saying, we are small, but we're mighty. And um, that, that has always stayed with me as uh, a beautiful description. And the one thing that I would comment about my experience of listening to this today is that it's absolutely amazing to find the creativity 
in adversity and being able to treasure what we learn. But I do want to just say a word of the need to grieve for the thing that was lost. Because there have been things that have been lost uh, during this time. And for me, I lost Christmas. Uh, so for me, I'm still struggling with that. And for me, I lost being able to see my friend who died in the days before she died. And, and I would have been able to if it hadn't been for the COVID intervention. And this is something that I will never get back. And Christmas 2021, I will never get back. So I just want to put in a word about the need for grief too, amidst these times of struggle. But I also want to say I have come to peace uh, about my friend. I was praying for her during the pray prayer time and I could feel her with me. And she got to eat my mince pies. I know that <laughs> on Christmas Eve. So that, and she died on Boxing Day, day after Christmas. So I feel like I was part of her life in a very meaningful way. I was part of her dying in a meaningful way. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, I had actually intended to have that in my sermon and I, I just forgot it while I was preaching. So thank you for adding it. It's such an important piece. There is very real grief. Um, in all of the losses, and it is important to be with them and grieve them, and it's, it's a very odd paradox, so I'm so glad you were able to have a connection with your dear friend, and we will continue to hold her spirit in light. What is her name? Mary? Beverly. Beverly. Yes. No, no, I went back to being muted. Marilyn. 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 Okay. You pray for Marilyn. So much for my liberty. Spirit. Yeah, that's spirit. That's Continue in your heart. Thank you, Cindy. Ruth, did you want to answer? Yeah, I, uh, I, I loved your bringing in John Prendergast, um, and I, and I just wanted to share with everyone that um, I am delighted that I'm going to be able to have this course with him. It's going to be the next four. Unfortunately, it's the next four Sundays between 10 and noon. So I, that was a hard decision, but it, it's an opportunity and I'm hoping to share with you what I learned. It's about how to be grounded, remember who we tr truly are in the face of all the unknown stuff that we deal with. And, um, also, I really appreciated your perspective on Mary going, really? Not yet? Really? And that was me uh, yesterday. Really? We're not going to find a solution to this cell phone thing? Really? We have to go over? <laughs> and not losing the perspective that I'm talking about a cell phone. This is hardly major difficulty. Um, and this morning, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for being more at peace. And I just want to also share an experience. Um, uh, it, it's gotten difficult for me to walk around as as many of you have seen. Uh, and I was at Costco, and I was putting my stuff in my trunk and then started looking around to where I was going to have to walk over and return the cart. And the people next to me, he he came up and he said, can I take the cart for you? And it was just this small moment of kindness. And, and I... I was close to tears because it, it, just this experience of there is ongoing goodness in the world. You never know when there be, may be some small moment of discovering the goodness and, and that you're, that I've cared for, that we're, we're cared for by other people. So I will have you in my prayers. Um, during the next four weeks, and I look forward to 
seeing you again. Thank you, Ruth, and we look forward to hearing more about what you've learned and uh, finding a way for you to share that with us. And thank you for the even the the sharing the story about the Costco man helping you because what I noticed is that you noticed it too and you took it in and you remembered it and so often you know in the moment we can kind of notice it in the moment and forget about it right but the fact that it has stayed with you as a gift of yes. a sign from God right that's a um, reminder to all of us to try and savor those moments because God you know and the angels are with us sometimes they're in they're at Costco um, but if, if we pay attention yeah that's it yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just, I too wanted to join in and share my thoughts about today's service. It was just so spot on as it always is. And, um, you know, I've always known that as you go through things that they're not necessarily what you choose that, you know, there's probably good that will come out of it and things are a blessing in disguise. And um, the service today did that so remarkably well with everything that was shared. And I, I really love the I Smile at the Rain poem, um, read so beautifully by Dean. And um, just everything I've, I've been experiencing in my life this year, um, you know, there's always that um, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow after, you know, some of the, the troubles that, that we face. And we j just, you know, we're going through things for a reason that make us stronger on the other side. Um, I appreciate all of you and I'm touched by all of your words and just seeing you all. Um, thank you. Thanks for the, the words today. Okay. Everybody. Thanks. Good to see you. Home. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else who's off camera want to share? Anybody else in person? Yeah. Uh, Jim and Wendy. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect a little bit about how you know, we, we are facing a change that we don't know what, what the magnitude of the change is even going to be in the end here in, in our way of life and how we interact with each other even. Is, is, but when, when we look at the at the story or at the scripture, uh, Jesus started his life with a detour to Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and so basically we're facing our detour right now. And um, I, I don't think we're going to end up in Egypt, but we, we may end up somewhere even far more different because um, this... Uh, the fact that this uh, pandemic is, is so life-threatening and so disruptive to what we've come to know as our way of life, all of the all of the modern technological uh, systems we put in place to, to uh, control, govern, and even facilitate life as we know it are are threatened by this, and we're seeing that begin to even more dig, dig deeper and deeper into where we're seeing shortages, where, where we're chasing one minute we're chasing masks and we're chasing something else or next thing you know we're chasing gasoline and then now we're, now we're back to chasing masks again. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that we need to process this in a manner that what we hear and see and feel today is probably not a, what not at all what we're going to see in the future. But what we're going to see in the future is something that we need to process on a daily basis. We need to be ready for this. We need to be open. It's very difficult. It's very difficult when you know, we go to the store and our favorite crackers not on the show. <laughs> for two weeks, you know, what the hell's the matter with these people? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's not the problem, folks. <laughs> this isn't about crackers not being on the shelf. Yeah, for some of us it is, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> so, but today it is. But today it is. So, I don't want to go on all night with this, but the, the world and, and the life as we know it 
may, may never be the same, probably will not be the same. And the only way we're going to be able to cross this, says this, because it's much bigger than any one of us as an individual, is through, through God, mm -hmm. through, through the spiritual awakening that we need to come to God and we need to be able to get more people to come to God and, and process it in that manner rather than lashing out in society, uh, burning things down, fighting with each other. And, and that's, that's where our future lies. Or the, the, this can go a number of different ways. I, I really believe that. And I think that the, the more spiritual and the more God and that we have indwelt in us as we process it, uh, will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And, uh, and I'll add something too. That what, I mean, just that comment of where we have to process it every day. Um, what I thought as you were saying that was that we're invited to pray every day, right? And then because I know for myself, if I kind of skip my morning practice, I'm going to hear the news much differently. I'm going to go straight to anxiety rather than, oh, that's interesting. Um, so it's just an, an invitation to all of us, right, to continue to do our spiritual practice because that's going to ground us and keep us connected to God and we will respond rather than react uh, more likely when we're able to do that. So, yeah, um, or pray every day as well for us. And then you, yeah. Just a very quick, I just remembered while you were talking, Jim, that I learned once from a rabbi that the word Egypt can mean a narrow place, oh. a place of restriction. Oh. And, you know, in the Jewish tradition, they only say we were slaves in Egypt and oh. God brought us out. Right. Right. Just, right. Just really it's very true. There's also a lot of cool things in Egypt, and I just want to highlight that too. <laughs> a lot of cool spiritual stuff in Egypt too. We don't want to forget that. No. Yeah, I thank you as well for bringing this all to our our consciousness. I I may have an idealized uh, thought about what what life was like back in that day. Jesus, but I, I have a sense that people did live in a spiritual manner because they didn't have scientific understanding, mm -hmm. or whatever. They lived in more spiritual grounded, uh, off the land. You have to pay attention. Yeah. You have to pay attention yeah. uh, to where you were in order to, to to have your life move forward in a healthy way. And. And there's so much of that in this story of the Magi and, yeah. and Joseph and, uh, and all, all the transitions mm -hmm. that they see the signs. Mm -hmm. They don't miss the sun. That's true. Yeah. They mm -hmm. see them. Mm -hmm. And that happens from being grounded. That's true. Uh, and at the same time, I was also thinking of the baby Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it, Young change, this birth of a form of change that came into the world, and how how fragile, and the the whole thing with Herod brings that out. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of threats, yeah. uh, and I'm reminded of that. Uh, in my own recovery from drug addiction. Uh, one of the things that was vastly important to me was you don't have to change much, you just have to change all your friends and your places you hang out <laughs> and you get life and you know, just that too thing. much needs to change. Uh, <laughs> and it's true. If if we're being led into change Holding on to what we mm -hmm. had before right. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. Change needs to be in a more nurturing environment. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Yeah. And the, I love what you said about they didn't miss the signs. You could hear that on Zoom. One of the points Dean also had was they didn't miss the signs because they were grounded spiritually. They saw them, paid attention to them, and then the change sometimes. Uh, was really complete in our life. Yeah, Gene. We're all speaking up today. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. But, uh, I think about uh, the circumstances that led to me moving into Fairfax, not my choosing. It was chaotic, it was rough. Um, but there, 
was a moment I was walking down the dance road and I realized I'm exactly where I need to be. Oh, and I'm exactly what I should be doing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so God works in mysterious ways is another one of those, those things that we say that is often true, isn't it? Yeah. So, like Mary, we can ponder all these things in our hearts and continue to look for the stars in our life and the signs, the guideposts that God is with us, God is guiding us, and um, stay present in the moment as we allow things to unfold. So this um, season, we've also been talking about light, the light and the darkness, right? And the light of the star guiding us. And uh, so um, Tom and Joanne have prepared a really amazing song for us. And so we want to um, really uh, give some time for that. Okay, sorry, sorry. I need this microphone for that. Yes, and uh, let me see if I can do that. Sure. I can't get it without this. This is going to get water for a second.
transforms us to places that just mere words can't. So that was a gift. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And for our folks at home, I want to also show you um, our actual, in case you haven't seen it, forgive me, the camera is focusing itself there for a second. There it goes. So we have our angel's wings and our, our Christmas tree. And then if you look up, we have our star. Yay. <laughs> There's our epiphany star. In case you've missed seeing it. So just wanted to um, share that view with all of you as well as you are with us here in the sanctuary. And with us here in person as well. We're not getting busy there. And um, we will then come to our conclusion. And uh, we can also... Uh, Bless our offering that we did today. Um, and if you have an offering that you would like to give, feel free to just uh, place it on the table or place it in your hearts or uh, scan that QR code if you want to make a donation via the website. And um, let us uh, share together the uh, closing blessing. And invite us to stand as you are able, unless you have been at home, you can stay seated, of course. But, um, And let us share this closing blessing. In the great light of the night sky and its unbounded stretches of space, we glimpse the shinings of your presence, O God, in the universe of our soul. And its boundless depths, we look for emanations of your light. In the silence of sleep and the dream of the night, we watch for jewels of infinity. Guide us to awaken to the light within us today as we carry your love into the world. And then let us share our closing. Oh. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Yeah.